Hey guys, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, yes, I can. Okay, let me try to share my screen first. Uh, can you please confirm once you can see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Awesome, great. Are we good to start or we wait another couple of minutes? Yeah, we are good to start. So um, today, uh, Pandian and Vikas are presenting about the evolution of Android Key Store, how the Android Key Store, you know, have uh, changed uh, from the different versions of Android. So uh, yeah, you guys can start. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk on evolution of Android Key Store. And uh, thanks to the organizers for accepting our uh, in, uh, accepting our uh, talk. And uh, thanks to you all for joining this uh, for this talk. All right. So let's get started. Yeah. Okay. So firstly, a quick formal introduction about uh, both of us. So Gautam. Uh, Gautam works as Thales TIS as a security researcher and an architect. Uh, he has been contributing a lot to uh, to the open source community. Uh, recently, he was the creator of the R2Pay CTF uh, competition, which happened at R2Con. Uh, yeah, you can catch him up on his GitHub account. Uh, the handle is given. And about myself, so I'm also working as Thales TIS uh, as a colleague of Gotham, and I have a master's in information security. Uh, I've been actively contributing to uh, OWASP MSTG guide. And you can also catch me up on uh, GitHub. Uh, my handle is given. Okay, so uh, that's how our talk is structured. So we'll start with what is a key store. And then we'll get into some specifics of the key store, like the current existing uh, functionalities which are there on the key store. Uh, then we get into the interesting part where we talk about some attacks on the key store. Uh, then we have a quick comparison with the iOS keychain. Uh, and then from our, based on our experience, we have some improvements to suggest uh, that we can do on the Android key store. And then we'll conclude our presentation. So just to remind everyone that that when we are dealing with cryptography, when we are dealing with encryption, it's the security of the key which matters. And uh, yeah, that's the whole theme that we'll be sticking with, uh, that how important the key is uh, in, in terms of cryptography. Okay, so firstly, what is a key store before getting into the specifics of Android? So key store is a repository uh, where you can store your cryptographic keys and various other secrets. Uh, this repository provides you the integrity and confidentiality of the stored uh, crypto material. You can store like symmetric keys or asymmetric key pairs, certificates in this repository. Now there are two flavors in which this is implemented, like uh, uh, it can be implemented in, in the software itself, uh, which, which was done in the past and to some extent in current uh, mobile ecosystem as well. And then you have the hardware backed one. And this is where we will be eventually concentrating on. Uh, hardware backed key store means nothing else but having a dedicated uh, hardware functionality uh, to perform cryptographic operations and to ensure that uh, or, or to provide extra security uh, to the key material. We'll look into the specifics of this as well. Uh, currently, there are two technologies which, which are broadly being used. One is based on the ARM press zone where the uh, the application processor is logically divided into two parts, uh, often uh, referred as a normal world and the secure world. And secure world is the one where all the cryptographic operations are being performed. And then there's another approach called secure element, uh, which in Android we can relate to strongbox uh, uh, terminology. <clears throat> and we'll be talking about that one as well. So a quick overview of how the Android key store looks like. So if we broadly divide it into two parts, one is the part where the APIs are concerned, where which we as a developers are interacting with. And then there's the whole implementation part of it. 
Uh, on the implementation side of it, uh, most of the things are done in Keymaster HAL, where HAL stands for Hardware Abstraction Layer. And uh, this HAL is implemented by the OEMs, and uh, which includes the kernel interface, the whole secure world, as I mentioned, uh, implementation as well. And because, overall this, yeah. Sorry, uh, the slides are not moving. Slide uh, not moving. It is. Oh. Uh, it's uh, the first hmm. slide only. It's showing. That's strange. Okay. Maybe you can exit the full screen. Is it if it is? Yeah, maybe I can try that. Yeah. Thanks for pointing out, man. Okay. Is it different now? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Then I have to do it without full screen. Then. Okay. So. Yeah, just to reiterate, so I was talking about uh, how the Android key store can be looked into in terms of the architecture. And uh, this diagram can help uh, to understand that, yeah, there is a, uh, a key store API part of it where we as developers are interacting and then the, the, the HAL part, which the OEMs are implementing. So let's have a quick discussion about how things look like uh, before uh, KitKat was released. So we will be dividing uh, the talk before KitKat and after KitKat, uh, because that's where the major changes started to happen uh, after KitKat. So before KitKat, things were quite simple. Uh, there was something called a credential store, and uh, it solved the problem of where to store the Wi-Fi and the VPN credentials. And uh, this credential store was introduced in Android 1.6. It was a software-based solution, and it was only available for system-based applications, for example, settings or VPN or Wi-Fi apps or processes which were running. And interestingly, this whole solution was not available to the third-party users. So if you, as an application developer, wants to use this functionality, it wasn't uh, made available to you. Another interesting aspect was if as a setting, settings application or a process you store something in this credential store, then this will be available to Wi-Fi and VPN as well. So anything pre present in the credential store will be available system-wide. So there was no app-based isolation of the, of the credentials that you were storing. And if you have done some kind of uh, man in the middle testing of the uh, uh, Android uh, traffic for the uh, Android application, uh, you might have uh, installed your own certificate and the, the application that you're interacting with is nothing else but the credential store. So here is one screenshot for that. Uh, moving forward, so by Android 4, things started to improve further uh, given the adoption of uh, Android OS as well. And in Android 4, Keychain API was introduced, uh, which made the credential store available to the public, the third party developers. And there were some uh, changes in the background as well, like instead of using the sockets, it was using binders, so better OS integration was there. Uh, interestingly, from this version onwards, there was the start of uh, supporting a hardware back key store uh, or, or the storage. Uh, the initial code was uh, committed uh, from Android 4.0 and 4.1 onwards. So here the stage is set for the upcoming changes which will be happening in the key store. A quick look on how the things worked in the software side of things. So when you're storing uh, these credentials only in the software. Uh, it was using a con uh, yeah, I mean to to encrypt the uh, the key material. Uh, it was having a master key. Now this master key had two variants uh, of of deriving it, like before uh, before Android four and after Android four. So before Android four, there was a dedicated credential store protection password, and after Android four, it was based on your unlock pin or pattern. And uh, this particular password or this information was fed into the key generation algorithm, uh, which was PBKDF2. And it had 8192 iterations of it. And plus there was a 128-bit uh, salt as well. So in the end, what we get was a 128-bit AES key. And this key was used as the master key to encrypt the other incoming uh, or, or the stored uh, key material. So if you can see, I mean, it's it's a pretty good solution for a software-based thing, but 
yeah, there were a lot of limitations that once you the master key was compromised or, or you can determine what the master key is, which was there on the file system itself, you can decrypt everything. So there were a lot of shortcomings with this approach. So things started to get interesting after the KitKat, especially from Android 6.0 onwards. And this is where the fingerprint-based authentication was introduced. Now, it's important to note that fingerprint-based authentication was uh, eventually using the hardware back key store, uh, which is now available from Android 6 onwards. And uh, the fingerprint template or whatever information is needed is stored in the hardware back one so that the information doesn't leave the device. Uh, yeah, and it's it's pretty hard to extract this information out, out of this uh, key store. Uh, additionally, AES and HMAC support was also added uh, to the Android key store. A few comments on the biometric authentication as a whole. So initially things started as fingerprint authentication, but as we know later on, face, iris, and other forms of biometric authentication were added. And uh, yeah, when you're having a key or key pair uh, generated in the key store, uh, there, there are a few ways where you can uh, do the access control. So access control meaning in the sense that how often or which way you can use the key. So one is that, yeah, basically you set this information while you're creating the key. So one way is that, okay, no authentication. You just go and start using the key uh, without uh, yeah any kind of access control the other way is that yeah only if the device is unlocked by the user then only you can use this key uh, there are other ways as well i mean one one is that uh, the key is valid only for a period of time uh, once you do the biometric authentication or the key guard authentication and this one has a lot of use so this one is being used by google pay uh, in google fido 2 authentication and other contactless uh, payment apps Uh, yeah, this key attestation was one of the most important feature. Uh, if you look in hindsight, uh, it provides a lot of power to the developers. And uh, it, it answers one of the very basic question that, okay, I have the key as an application. I have generated the key. It's there on my system or it's on my device. But as a server, how can you assure the server that this key is in the hardware back key store? So as I said, hardware back key store ensures that the, the key remains in the system on the device that cannot be extracted outside the device. It provides additional security compared to the software uh, implementation. And yeah, key attestation solves this problem. Key attestation generates a public key certificate. Uh, it's, it's a whole chain of uh, uh, public key certificates uh, which, which give the description about the key, its access control, and the information about the hardware on it which uh, being stored. And uh, uh, for, for example, the information like whether the bootloader is unlocked or not. Uh, so I have a diagram for this. So yeah, this is how the keychain looks like. Uh, so you will see that there is uh, at the bottom uh, a Google root certificate, which is a self-signed one by Google uh, installed on the device uh, uh, while, while the manufacturing. And then a key uh, attestation public key, uh, basically attestation key pair is generated and the public key is part of the certificate chain. Uh, you can say this is the intermediate certificate. And then the final one in this particular chain is the, uh, the public key of the keeper that we have generated, that we are attesting the information. And uh, yeah, so this whole keychain is sent to the server uh, and, and to ensure that there cannot be any replay attacks, uh, the server can share a challenge and that challenge will be part of this uh, final certificate as well. So this is how the overall certificate chain looks like and how's the attestation done. So once the things go to the server, uh, they can verify that, okay, it's signed by the Google's uh, public key and then they can verify the whole chain. This is a typical example of how the attestation information looks like. So I have used the app, uh, which is available on GitHub. Uh, it's mentioned in the references as well, if you want to use it. And you can see over here that uh, apart from the key information, there's a lot of other information about the device. And uh, the interesting thing to note over here is that 
it specifies how the system or the application uh, or the, the key store or the key master process itself uh, got this information so tee over here refers to the hardware back thing and sw refers to the software and there's one particular information which is coming from the software rest of all of them is from the hardware so if something is from the hardware the level of trust is higher you can more or less trust on this information that's how the whole system is designed and you can also see in this case that uh, my bootloader was unlocked uh, when i was testing it and it's kind of indicated in the app and it's there in the whole information uh, this information in the final output as well of the attestation uh, it's important to note that if something is coming from the software uh, then it can be spoofed so this is something to keep in mind that yeah you cannot always 100 percent trust the information coming from the software now this has a lot of uh, use cases and it's already being adopted in a in, in a big way for example a bank app wants to uh, determine if the device is secure and once this is established using key attestation uh, then they can go on with the other advanced functionalities like electronic payments generating a public private key pair uh, to to uh, sign these payments and ensuring that yeah it's the correct user uh, attesting this uh, payment fedro2 is using this uh, information for registration process uh, to prove that the uh, the authenticator of the device uh, is of certain uh, at the certain security level uh, and and then safety net is using this so safety net is the uh, functionality by google itself to provide some kind of assurance on the uh, on the integrity of the device yeah so this is uh, being used in the background again by safety net taking this key attestation forward in android 800 they introduced the whole concept of id attestation uh, and and you can see that okay id attestation is nothing else but uh, now Android is trying to tell that, okay, whatever the information is being advertised about the device, that is accurate. So, which includes all the information that I have listed over here. There have been further improvements in Android 12 as well. There were some shortcomings in Android 8 when it was introduced, but now things are improving on this side as well. Then there was another problem being solved using the secure key imports. So, often a scenario arises that the server wants to share a secret with the application for example to do the communication in the future or to encrypt certain set of information in the uh, yeah for for any kind of secret sharing or confidential sharing not the secret but confidential sharing so if we go by the traditional way then it's very difficult for the server to send this uh, the symmetric key to the mobile application in a secure way either it will go in the clear on the network traffic or it will be clear in the uh, process memory of the application so there are a lot of loopholes in which the symmetry key can be attacked now with secure key import uh, yeah you can see with this diagram that a key pair is generated by the application using the hardware cap uh, back key store and then the public key from this key pair is used by the server to encrypt the symmetric key and then this symmetric key or the whole encrypted thing uh, with the public key is sent back to the device and then the device just decrypts using the private key and then stores this uh, symmetric key so by using this whole process it's ensured that the key is never in clear at any point of time until it reaches the, the hardware back key store of the device. So this is a pretty good way of ensuring that the secrets can be shared between two, uh, two ends of the same service. Then as I mentioned about Strongbox, so there are limitations or certain advanced attacks which can be done uh, when you're using the ARM trust zone technology, although they're really advanced. I mean, they are not something that uh, uh, can be done easily, but then, given the current landscape of mobile ecosystem all threats are possible and a lot of critical information is there on mobile devices so google came up with the idea of uh, strongbox and it's it's the implementation of the key master hal for a hardware uh, hardware security module now instead of having uh, the trust zone which was running on the same application processor the cpu uh, but logically separated you have a dedicated chip 
uh, which which have its own isolated CPU, RAM, and secure storage. So it's like a whole different chip on the same uh, SOC of the mobile. And it's considered to be more uh, stronger uh, and more secure. And uh, for example, it can protect against the row hammer or specter kind of attacks which are there. And this strong box is nothing else but the but the specific implementation for such kind of chips. And that's that's what strong box is. Then in Android 11, now when the whole basic infrastructure was set with Strongbox and tamper resistant hardware, uh, in Android 11, the concept of storing identity documents uh, was launched. And this means that you can have a mobile driving license, national ID or e-passport stored on your Android device securely. It can even be used for uh, digital keys, like for your car or uh, home and office. And uh, yeah, I mean, before uh, Strongbox was there, such functionalities do exist on the Android or, or iOS as, a, as an ecosystem. But then all those functionalities were very much based on the software protections, like using uh, runtime protections and self defenses and various other uh, clever techniques like obfuscation to, to protect this information. Okay, so that's conclude my part. Now I'll hand over to Gautam on the interesting part where all the attacks are done on the key store. Gautam, please go ahead. Thank you, Vikas. I will share my screen. Okay, are you able to see the screen? Yes, it is. Okay, hello all, good morning. So I'll be talking about the attacks, uh, which we have uh, find out, found out in uh, using this key store before getting into the complete set of attack demos and all. So I will initially talk about uh, the, uh, the threat model for uh, any mobile application. So what happens is uh, as a threat for a threat model, we have two categories of attackers, usually a malicious app uh, or malware, which can execute uh, on the device and it tries to attack the secure uh, key storage of another app installed on the same device. So the malicious apps tries to actually abuse the APIs of the application, or it can abuse the system APIs to gain access to uh, the data, which is in the other applications. Uh, as a root attacker, a, a root attacker might have a root privileges and it is, uh, he's able to run any apps under the root permissions. And uh, he can also use uh, uh, a very popular root exploits, which is available uh, uh, available, and they, they can actually try to gain the root privileges to make some uh, attacks on the other applications on the device. Also, there are, we find a lot of users or uh, fans for customizing their devices. So they root their device with popular uh, uh, routing frameworks. And uh, we also find a lot of Play Store applications which needs a root for running. So these applications are highly privileged applications and in any case they became uh, rogue. So they can actually try to access other applications data or even it can manipulate uh, the data and are also intercept the network traffic and all. Uh, loss or a theft of a mobile mobile device is a very common scenario as well. Uh, so this is something which uh, is always possible on uh, uh, on the mobile uh, device because the mobile device consists of all kinds of personal data which uh, everybody is interested in. So losing a mobile device is a very common scenario as well. So we will look into some sort of uh, the existing uh, key store protections. Okay. okay, so the for existing key store protections, the most important thing is about having a device binding. Uh, the key store is the one major component in Android system which uh, provides this uh, fac uh, facility for the applications. So all the keys are, uh, uh, when the application generates or imports a key, it is in fact uh, protected inside a hardware-backed key which is unique uh, to that specific device. So this brings the real uh, device binding for applications instead of applications really depending upon other factors like IMEI. So they uh, or other uh, Android ID kind of uh, data. This is one sort of uh, a good device binding feature which they can actually use it. 
the other important thing is like when you unlock the device bootloader for uh, when you try to do a routing of the device so all the key materials which is uh, provisioned already in the device is actually cleared off so this is one of the security features of uh, the android keystroke the other important thing is like the key material when when an application accesses it is uh, it never comes into the application memory so it generally uh, it's uh, processed either in the system process or in the HAL, where it uh, has all the hardware backed uh, cryptographic services uh, where it, so that it can actually perform uh, the most important uh, crypto operations without uh, bringing the key inside the device memory. Uh, the next part is about having the uh, app binding. So when uh, application uh, in, imports or generates a key inside the key store, the key can be only used by the application which uh, actually uh, generated it. So uh, in addition, the applications can also uh, use some of the Keystore APIs to perform uh, some of the, uh, to, to provide more access controls, uh, such as having a, a fingerprint authentication or, uh, or the key card authentication, they can actually enable it. So that this key can be used only by that app and it can be used only by the user of the device. Uh, then only the key can be actually be used for further crypto operations. When uh, an app creates the key, so they can actually provide a set of purposes uh, for when they either generate or import. So for example, uh, they can give it, this key can be used only for signing or encryption or decryption. So there can be other properties or also can be assigned to it. So basically which algorithm can be used and for uh, what are the padding and uh, what are the modes which uh, which this crypto algorithm can actually be used. So this this kind of uh, flexibility is given to the application and the, that, that particular key can be used only for that specific purpose and that specific algorithm can be used. The key has also a valid duration validity. So you can also set it uh, in the later part of Android uh, APIs uh, where the, the key can be uh, an expiration date can be actually set up. So uh, beyond that time, the key is invalid. Uh, in uh, for, for authentication validity, there is a validity period given for uh, the key to be on uh, to be used. So that kind of uh, flexibility is also available. So these kind of things make sure that the keys can be accessed uh, only for a shorter period of time and it is not valid beyond uh, the lifetime uh, what the application has already configured for. The other most important thing is about the key attestation. So this actually provides the real confidence that the key is in fact generated inside a particular device and uh, it is also in, uh, generated inside the secure hardware. So generally, normally a server, when it receives a public key, it doesn't have an idea that it is received from the particular device. So with key attestation, so it can have more confidence on uh, this particular, where exactly the keys are generated and uh, what are the properties associated with that. So as to confirm that it is uh, coming from a rightful app and uh, the keys uh, created properly. Now let's see how the keys are actually protected uh, inside uh, the inside the device. So when application creates it, so the basis of that is when application is installed on the device, is uh, the Android system assigns a unique UID uh, for that specific application. So this UID is the one which helps in mapping the application and its keys. Uh, normally, when a key is generated by an application, so you can see on the diagram below. Uh, it, it is actually, it will be stored as an encrypted key blog in the file system. So all these files are in fact uh, protected under a C Linux context. Uh, so and the user is the key store user. So it is usually an app will have some U01805, something like that. So which, uh, which is the UID of the app. So when it calls the key store API, key store ensures that it is uh, generated properly and it is uh, stored uh, in encrypted form with the key store user thing. So the structure for the structure of the uh, files, uh, which is present here, uh, structure of the file name is, okay, first uh, it indicates the UID of the app which created it, uh, whether it is a user certificate or it is a private key or a symmetric key. Usually for a symmetric key and private key, it's uh, named as user key key. And the last part is the alias which application has given. So this is a quick overview about uh, how uh, application can uh, generate and uh, what happens under the hood. 
So when an application generates a key with an alias, so all it goes, goes towards the uh, key master uh, trusted app where it actually generates the key. Uh, they have a very uh, strong secure random inside the trusted app to generate a key with a strong entropy. Um, this key is uh, actually now encrypted with a kick. Uh, this, the encrypted uh, key, key blob is actually now passed back to the key store daemon and it is actually stored uh, by the key store daemon. So uh, next time, so it will, when an application calls for an encryption using this alias and it gives the data to be protected, what happens is the key store daemon, um, so it first verifies the UID of the application and it can uh, now it sees the file name which contains the UID. So it is uh, and the alias, for, it can construct the file name and see if this uh, app is uh, really can actually access that specific key and uh, it will then call the key master TA for uh, further uh, encryption of the data. So it sends back the key blob the encrypted and uh, the data uh, here, the key master TA will try to do the decryption using the kick uh, and using the key, it can actually start encrypting the data and give it back to the application. So this is uh, just an overall idea about how it uh, generally works under the hood. Uh, it could vary uh, from uh, OEMs to OEMs because the key master TA is something is uh, done by the OEM side. Okay, let's come to the uh, interesting part of it. So what we have done is uh, we are uh, going to show two demos. So, so the first demo is about the atta attacking the app binding. Uh, so one of the key uh, claims of the key store is uh, the key can be accessed only by the app that actually provisioned it. But what we noticed is this app UID, uh, which is, it's not actually cryptographically bound to the key. It is only present uh, in the file name. Uh, and uh, so this could actually be misused or abused by a, a malware uh, with uh, a key store privilege or as a root privilege. So uh, with this privilege, it can actually copy the contents of any key of any apps and replace that uh, app UID with uh, the UID of uh, the, uh, the malware ones. Now the malware can now access the key with the same properties as set by the original app. So this is because it is an encrypted key block. Uh, so it is not possible for uh, a malware to change the key properties, but uh, without knowing what is the key, it can now start using the key to decrypt uh, the encrypted contents uh, of the app actually. So app might have used the same uh, the key store key to uh, encrypt some data. So, uh, so likewise, a malware can also try to do the other way. It can decrypt the encrypted content. So in case if the application is uh, using the key for signing, uh, so it can actually, the malware can also do the signing on behalf of the original app. So to bring some more in, in, in insights into that is, uh, so let's see if it is, uh, so this is the key which is generated by a proper application. Uh, so here you see whatever I have shown earlier. So uh, this is the original key which is created by the uh, proper uh, legitimate application. And uh, this is the AC Linux context, uh, which is associated with this key. Now uh, a rogue application uh, can now start copying and the rogue application should have some root privilege or a, a key store user privilege to copy uh, these contents to, uh, to another content and then rename it to a value which is uh, assigned to that particular malware app. Now you can change the ownership so that uh, you become uh, the key store user. Uh, so right now I'm a root user, so you can change the ownership and uh, once you are done with this, then you are good to go. So using this key, uh, the malware can actually use this key for uh, performing its own operations. So to show as a demo, actually I'll share my screen again for... Okay, uh, I hope it is visible now. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so uh, what we have done is uh, I have taken one of the application which is uh, um, present uh, in the GitHub, like it's a Google's application where it is uh, to demo the biometric authentication. I've taken the same thing. So this particular application is uh, 
modify to actually it uh, generates a symmetry key inside the keystroke. And uh, that symmetry key is used to it encrypted our data and uh, on authentication now it will try to decrypt it. So what you can see here is I have done one now. I have done an authentication and uh, I'm able to uh, decrypt the content. Uh, the content which I have protected is a list of zeros. So that's why you see it as a little set of A's, which is nothing but a base 64 in, uh, important data. So now, now the actual attack starts. Like uh, I gain uh, the root privilege. I log into any shell, do a root, uh, get the root, and uh, try to get into the key store uh, path. Okay, first I get the list of uh, packages, which is uh, which I'm interested in. So I'm interested in this particular fingerprint dialog application. So its UID is 10184. Next, I go inside the uh, key store path to actually fetch uh, what is the key which is uh, generated by this particular UID. So this is to just show all the uh, all the keys which is generated by all the applications will be present in this one particular folder. So I see this particular key which is uh, generated with the alias default key by uh, by this particular uh, user ID. So now I copy copy it into the uh, into another file which is controlled by the rogue application. So when I copy it, uh, so it is now copied with the, the root privilege. So all I need to see is I need to change the ownership back to the key store user. So now I can see that uh, I have another key which is uh, which is related to uh, the rogue application. So now I go back to the rogue application, which is having which is called a fake biometric authentication. So I have access to the encrypted content. So I now I now use this key to decrypt that specific content and get that value same as that of the original application. So here, the point to notice there is additional user authentication and other things are there. So about the, as a malware application, it needs to take some more efforts to actually break the complete uh, system. But uh, which is which is not like inevitable, but it is uh, it's still possible to make this attack as a malware. Okay, so the hardware-backed key store ensures the key cannot be extracted from the device, but uh, but it can be used uh, by another malware application in this specific case. So that's the point which you wanted to drive. Uh, as a scenario-wise, we a uh, lot of applications use uh, key store as a main uh, security component. So they actually make use of uh, for any any kind of cryptographic operations or any kind of uh, secure storage of a key. So they rely on uh, Android key store. So by uh, so uh, if they use it like that, so there is a possibility as a malware they can be uh, they can be attacked. Okay. So if, even if it is like uh, application uses it for local data encryption or it is for signing, so it can be done by a malware on behalf of the original application using this attack. Okay, so the second attack is about uh, the missing attestation. So the missing attestation here, we wanted to uh, stress the point that uh, many applications start using uh, the key store for generating the key pair and uh, send the public key to the server. The server uh, doesn't have any indication that the public key is in fact uh, generated by the application and whether it is really generated inside a device or not. So it can be done by somebody uh, on a desktop application also, they can actually do it and indicate to the server it is generated a key pair. Uh, so to, uh, but server right now, it just believes that it is coming from the application and uh, they may have additional uh, additional ways to actually detect that it is coming from a, a particular application. Uh, 
Um, so that is why actually the key attestation was introduced by uh, Android, uh, so that they have all this, uh, the key it gives more trust on the, the key which is actually generated. So here, what we wanted to uh, just demo here is to say that if application is generating key pair and using it in this context, so uh, there is also one more interface in the key store, which uh, weakens the system. Basically, key store also helps to import a key or a key pair. So when an application is trying to generate a key pair, so as a malware, I can actually uh, try to import a key or the key pair inside uh, the key store. So when uh, a malware is importing a key pair, it means that key, the, it knows both the values, the public private key values, so it can control, uh, it has a complete control on the key pair it is actually importing it. So for this uh, demo, I am taking uh, a Google Fido uh, authenticator on the, uh, uh, which is introduced in Android 8.0 and above. So Google actually provided a, a Fido authenticator, which is uh, which is on the uh, which is coming by natively. It is present. Uh, basically, they for web authentication, what does it mean? Is to actually helps to uh, provide a user agent mediated uh, credentials uh, to be associated with a device uh, uh, device authentication. So it provides a second factor authentication for uh, for re relying parties uh, who can actually generate, uh, uh, use the device authentication as a means for authenticating a particular user beyond, besides the password. So many applications, uh, many web applications are moving towards uh, this web authentication, which is really a cool uh, infrastructure which is present on the Android systems. Um, so what we found is uh, there is a missing uh, key attestation on this part and uh, how it can be attacked. So this demo is about uh, uh, to show how it can be uh, attacked using uh, using the dynamic instrumentation uh, with using the FIDA. So let's see here. So here we see this is the sorry. okay. So this is the uh, web uh, authentication demo. So I'm uh, first of all setting up the system to actually. Uh, we create the hooks uh, on the on the Google Android uh, package, which is nothing but it's a Chrome application, which is a Chrome application which is internally tied to the uh, the uh, web authentication of the FIDO2 APIs of uh, uh, Google. So web Authent IO is uh, nothing but the demo application, so which is uh, demo. Uh, demo URL where you can actually, uh, when you access it, it asks for registering your credentials on the device. So as part of the first step, it uh, we are choosing platform because we wanted to use platform credentials. So as when you try to register, the first step is it uh, creates, it calls the FIDO2 APIs of Google and uh, they can uh, create a key pair. And at the time of creating the key pair, now I'm importing a fake key pair uh, like this, okay? So already the key pair, which is inside the key store is controlled by, by this, uh, let's say it's called a malware. We, we have already imported into that. So I'm doing the authentication and now this public key is actually shared with the server and server can know that, okay, as long as you are able to sign on the device, you are authenticated. So now I'm logging in with uh, the, the, by signing the private key and you are already logged in and you can see the public keys uh, here. The public key is same as that of what, uh, what I have imported. So uh, the corresponding private key is actually used for signing and that's why the, uh, the server is able to uh, log, log you in. So you can also see several uh, key pairs I have generated with uh, the same key pairs because I am importing it multiple times. Uh, so I can see the same public key, you can actually see it. Okay. So coming back, okay, let's uh, go to the comparison and uh, improvements part. Um, so here we wanted to just compare between the Android key store and uh, iOS uh, keychain part. So some of the, uh, there are, both are almost having some similar features, but there are uh, finer differences which we wanted to discuss. So what happens is when, when an application, especially with respect to the key store, 
uh, when an application is uninstalled, the keys generated inside the key store are in fact uh, cleared off. Uh, so because when you install another app, that app can actually get a new UID, uh, the, the same UID of the original, the previous application. So it may be able to access the previously installed keys. That is why Aranda takes that uh, effort to clear the keys when application is uninstalled. But iOS, it is not the same case. Uh, when an application is uninstalled, the keys uh, which is generated inside the keychain are secure and clave or not wiped. Uh, the keys can be, um, so when an application is reinstalled, so you can still use the keys. Okay, so which, which is a bit of a problem, a security problem uh, when, the, when the device is not owned by the same user. So uh, the second point is about the algorithm support. So Android uh, key store supports a lot of uh, Cypher algorithms, almost uh, everything except for ECIES. ECIES is uh, internally supported uh, within the system, but it is not exposed for uh, applications to use. But the interesting part is in iOS, the only supported thing is ECIES and ECDSA with secure entry. So the remaining things can be used with uh, the keychain, but uh, not with the actually secure entry. So that's uh, one interesting differences. Coming to the authentication part, Android allows uh, access uh, per user authentication, uh, key access per user authentication, or uh, after authentication, the key will be valid for some period of time. Uh, whereas in iOS, you can gain access with a valid uh, uh, local authentication context uh, till it is invalidated by the user of the key. So in case the developer forgets to invalidate, invalidate it, the LA context can be misused to uh, keep accessing the key to perform the crypto operation on the iOS. Uh, coming to the last point, um, what happens uh, when, when the key is invalidated? So when a biometric is, uh, uh, new biometric is enrolled or all the biometrics are deleted, uh, the key store invalidates the key. And for this also application needs to uh, specify in the configuration when it is creating the key pair, key or key pair. Uh, whereas in iOS, uh, there is a setting. Uh, when, if you use the setting, so any addition or deletion of a particular uh, fingerprint invalidates the key. So next we'll move to the improvements part. So we have a set of improvements uh, after uh, researching into the key store for some time. And we have been using this key store for quite a number of products, even in our, in our company. So we wanted to suggest certain things uh, that can be incorporated into the key store uh, solution. So the first thing is about uh, the cryptograph, uh, the app UID spoofing, which we already showed. So this is something which is a concern uh, because if it is, if it can be trivially bypassed by malware by just copying the files, which is uh, not a good thing. So cryptographically binding the app UID to the key is uh, one thing, one mitigation which we can think of. Uh, but there are still attacks possible, and uh, uh, but the, that requires much more effort to actually uh, uh, pull that uh, attack possible. So, but uh, this is just or uh, just to bypass or to mitigate uh, upon the app UID spoofing part, uh, cryptographic binding could help. The next uh, point is about having an application specific password for accessing keys and key pairs. So normally Android doesn't allow uh, setting up a password for a, a key or key pair when you are using it with Android key store because Google thinks that uh, the developers might uh, tend to hard code the password, which is uh, which might weaken the system, which is which is in a way right. But there are use cases where we see that a user has to enter a password or a pin on that application. And this could not be really cryptographically bound to the key store keys, okay? So we see that if this, uh, if, a, if a key or keypad can be used with, uh, uh, with the application specific password as an access control besides the biometric authentication, it would be really good for certain set of applications which uh, uh, depends on user uh, user password uh, explicitly has to be entered into the, uh, into the device. Uh, there are also a lot of security sensitive applications which is uh, developed purely in the native part, but they don't have access to the key store in the native side. So for this purpose, they have to develop either Java or Kotlin side where they need to um, bring back the, go back and forth between the uh, Java and the native part to actually uh, get the keys, uh, and get it decrypted on the, on the Java side and bring it back to the native and perform the other operations. So if there is a way to actually access the key store via native code, it would be really good. 
So one finer detail about the secure key import. So what we noticed when we did this uh, a small demo on our side, uh, well, secure key import is a very nice feature, but uh, one of the uh, shortcomings is something like it, it doesn't enable authentication per key access. So which is, uh, which is kind of a, a weak, and weak, a weak part uh, in this particular overall solution. So you can still use biometric authentication, but it is with the key validity period alone, you can actually use it. So it is not per key access, you can actually use that. Okay, so we are coming to the last part of it. So here are the key takeaways uh, from this uh, presentation. So we discussed a lot of uh, features of the key store. Uh, we discussed about uh, the key attestation, biometric authentication, secure key import, identity credential store. Uh, and we also discussed about uh, the attacks, which is possible with uh, the existing key stores. Uh, so app UID binding issue, which we mentioned, and uh, the missing attestation with the Google FIDO authenticator. Uh, so given all these things, so it, uh, based upon the threat model, the key store usage has to be uh, may maybe may require additional sets of uh, protections or defenses on the application side. So it cannot purely just depend on key store alone as a main security component. It may need some additional things to actually protect your data. So we also discussed uh, about uh, comparing the Android and iOS uh, keychain and key store. Uh, and we also proposed uh, a set of uh, things that can be improved on the keystone. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much for listening. All right, thank, thank you guys. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, please uh, put them in the Discord day two, evolution of uh, Android key store. Um, I believe we have one question here. Uh, the question is, uh, are there any major changes expected in Android 12 with regards to key store? Any insight on that? Uh, you're muted, uh, Vikas. Okay, sorry. Uh, so yeah, one, one thing I noticed is that, the, as I mentioned, the idea testation part is uh, being improved. Uh, there are a bunch of new APIs, uh, which, are, which there are improvements. Uh, I won't say there's any drastic new feature. Um, Gautam, any inputs from you? Yeah, mainly the uh, the uh, biometric things is uh, so the ID ID attestation is the main thing. Um, besides that, I also don't see any new things. Yeah, yeah, but thanks for the question. Okay. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You were saying? Yeah, I was just saying. Uh, any other questions for us? Cool then, it seems, uh, yeah, we have been pretty clear. Awesome, thank you everyone for attending the talk and uh, we will hang out on the Discord channel. So feel free to ping us, uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you guys for your thank presentation. You. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you everyone, bye -bye. thank you, bye-bye.